Hello YouTubers, this is Amberola one b presenting another video presentation uh, for the YouTube channel and this is a instructional video being requested by Mr. Clyde Sight who is a very good tape recorder restorer and he's viewed a few of my videos using this machine to play some indestructible cylinders and one of his requests was that I give a demonstration on how this machine works this is not an official Edison Opera phonograph. I bought this on eBay from a seller in New York and he had it as it is being presented here in a reproduction opera case with an Amberola 1A mechanism. Now I don't know how it got paired up this way and how the uh, uh, opera horn was able to be attached to the reproducer fitting the way it is because usually on a 1A the reproducer fitting goes straight back and then down into an internal horn but somehow it got paired up with this I'm assuming it's a reproduction opera horn now this machine plays two and four minute cylinders being that it's an Amberola 1A and you can also direct the sound in any direction the horn is made out of paneled mahogany veneer and it is glued together with a wooden ring wrapped around the outside of the horn to hold the, the uh, panels together and a metal ring in the back to hold the back end of the panels together. And the wooden horn is inserted and clipped into this wooden, wood grained metal horn elbow. The horn is removed just by merely lifting it up. And I'm not sure how much it weighs, probably about two pounds, maybe a pound and a half, two pounds. It's very light so that it can swivel back and forth. Otherwise, as Clyde Sight indicated, that if it was very, very heavy, the whole machine might tip over. In the back here, we have a view of the speed control, which will vary the speed of the cylinders so that you can get it exactly at 160 RPMs and if you're not exactly at 160 you can also judge the speed of the cylinder by the uh, sound of the person's voice say you're used to hearing Billy Murray on a Victor 78 and if you're playing a Billy Murray cylinder either four or two minute cylinder you can always adjust the speed so that you can get his voice to sound just right and over here we have the two and four minute gearing knob. Now the difference between the Edison Music Master Horn and the Edison Signet Horn is that the Music Master Horn is attached to the back end of the reproducer carriage in such a way that it adds no extra weight to the reproducer as it's tracking the record. The record is only tracked by the weight of the tail weight that the stylus is attached to and it's not all that much so you don't have a lot of wear on the records however instead of taking the carriage assembly apart on my opera I've decided to show you the reproducer carriage and the feed screw and half nut on my Edison home model a the later model a now this is the reproducer carriage as you can see it moves across the record while the mandrel stays stationary and if I was to lower the reproducer cueing device onto the record, you will see over here that the half nut bar and the half nut will engage into the feed screw. And as it turns, the half nut travels across the feed screw, which is attached to the reproducer carriage, thus allowing the reproducer to move across the record and track the grooves of the record. Here it is in a little bit of a close-up. As you can see the feed screw has very fine grooves and the half nut which is attached to the half nut bar by these two screws has very fine and when the reproduced carriage is lowered onto the feed screw and I'll set it in operation so you can see it moving
you can see that the half nut tracks across the feed screw thus allowing the reproducer carriage to track the grooves of the record. The Edison signet horn which is attached to this later model A phonograph is attached with a horn crane and if you look in the back here you can see the horn crane back bracket which is attached to the case with four screws. The horn is suspended at the top of the crane with this spring and a threaded rod with a knurled nut that if you turn this nut one way or the other it'll adjust the weight of the horn either up or down to give sufficient enough weight to the horn to rest the reproducer against the record to track the record properly. Too much weight and the half nut riding on the feed screw will bear down too much on it and it'll slow the motor down. This machine here is capable of playing four two-minute cylinders and if there's too much weight of the half nut on the feed screw it'll prevent the machine from playing all four cylinders on a full wind. Too little weight and the reproducer will start to float above the record and it'll start skipping grooves and it'll start sticking in one place because the half nut won't have sufficient enough weight to track properly on the feed screw. Now as I stated even though there was an adjustment on the horn crane for the signet horns to adjust the proper tension that was needed on the half nut to guide it across the feed screw some medicine machines even had a little set screw adjustment back here that you could turn in either direction to force the half nut down on the feed screw or to lift it off depending on what downward pressure you needed to guide it across the feed screw and on other Edison machines it didn't have this feature but it merely had this piece of spring metal which you had to bend down or upward depending on how uh, it needed to be adjusted that was a little bit tougher because you had to kind of like gauge how far down it needed to go so that when the half nut is engaged with the feed screw it wouldn't add too much pressure otherwise it would slow the feed screw down by putting too much pressure on it from the half nut and then you'd have to bend it upward a little bit to uh, release some of that pressure okay here we see the opera mechanism out of its case here we see the winding crank the arbor now behind the arbor behind this casting is a small gear which meshes with this larger gear which in turn turns this rough toothed gear here which is permanently attached to this first spring barrel and when the winding arbor turns this gear here it turns the barrel and in turn turns both mainsprings to wind them up to release energy to uh, run the motor now if I come in close here you can see this rough toothed gear which is permanently attached to the spring barrel and behind it here is what's called a winding pawl now if I turn the crank a little bit you can see the edge of the winding pawl here and as you see the pawl toggles back and forth the other side of this pawl has a, two, has a uh, pointed edge just like this one and what it does is, is it grabs one of the teeth of this rough toothed gear here and prevents the gear from unwinding the spring barrels after you've wound them up because you don't want them to unwind quickly in the other direction or you'll release all that energy too quickly and then the uh, motor won't run so what happens is, is that Paul toggles back and forth as the spring is being wound and after you're through winding it it grabs that gear and prevents it from unwinding before you're ready to release the energy to the record okay on the other side of the spring barrel mechanism we see the gear train now this big bull gear here is attached to the second spring barrel with some screws and this big gear here meshes with this smaller gear on this first shaft and it turns this shaft and in turn will turn this large gear which will mesh with this small pinion gear on the secondary shaft which in turn will turn this large gear on the secondary shaft and you can't see it but behind here if I can bring in my camera possibly you can see right here is this third shaft and it has a small pinion gear back here which is turned by this gear on the secondary shaft and it turns this very fine-toothed gear here on the third shaft which in turn 
turns a very, very tiny pinion gear on the governor shaft, which in turn turns the pulley on the third shaft where the leather belt is attached and goes through a slot through the bed plate to the top part of the mechanism to turn the pulley up there to turn the mandrel to play the record which will be picked up by the reproducer. Now how this all works and I will show you this in a second as soon as I uh, wind up the motor a little bit. Let me bring back over here just so I can show you how this works. Now this spring barrel is stationary. It is permanently attached to the shaft of the casting with a, a rod that goes through both spring barrels and this spring barrel is the one that turns when the motor is being unwound. This, mo this spring barrel also turns but it doesn't turn when the motor is playing and the spring is unwinding. So I'm going to show you how this operates. You will see this spring barrel turn and this one stays stationary but when the motor is unwinding this one turns and this one stays stationary but there are springs very wide main springs in both barrels so here's how the operation takes place this spring barrel and so since I've after I've wound it sufficiently I will release the brake and you will see the left hand spring barrel move but the right hand spring barrel won't but both springs inside the spring barrels are unwinding And if you ever hear any thumping and bumping as the springs are unwinding in the barrels, it usually indicates that there's old dried grease in there and that the spring barrels have to be removed, the springs removed from the barrels, and they have to be cleaned off with some naphtha or gasoline or lacquer thinner, and then replaced in the spring barrels in the correct direction, and then re-greased. And then that should relieve all the uh, irregular movements in the springs as they're unwinding. So to bring this back over here, I will show you what the mechanism looks like as the springs are unwinding. I'll start down here and pan upward. So as you can see, the large bull gear is turning and thus turning this smaller gear here, which in turn turns this large gear on the same shaft, which in turn turns this small gear. I'll put a little more light up here which in turn on the same shaft turns this gear which turns this small pinion gear on the third shaft which in turn turns this fine toothed brass gear on that third shaft which in turn turns this very tiny pinion gear on the governor shaft which turns this pulley gear with the belt attached to it which turns the pulley on top of the mechanism, which turns the mandrel and allows energy to, to uh, play the record. Now when the governor is at rest, the governor's springs and weights are close to each other and close to the shaft in which they are attached. This is a friction disc, a brass friction disc. This is a little stirrup, I don't know what you would call it, but I refer to it as a stirrup, with two felt or leather pads attached to them which in turn press up against the friction disc when the brake is released and energy is released this friction disc will move towards this way a little bit up against these little pads which are free floating right now but once this uh, governor shaft is in motion this disc will push this way and it'll push up against these discs these pads thus regulating the speed of the governor now if these pads through the governor speed adjustment screw on top of the mechanism were uh, adjusted and they were made to move further away then when the brake is released the governor would move faster if they were moved towards this way and the brake is released the governor would move slower thus moving the mandrel slower so here I'm going to show you very slowly the governor moving but the weights are very close to the shaft now watch what happens when I release the brake fully. As you can see the weights are flaring outwards and pushing this friction disc 
up against these pads and allowing the governor to move only at a certain speed. Now if I can do this, I don't know if it's going to show up on the camera, but if I adjust the speed control, not only can you barely see the governor weights moving at a slower speed, but you can hear the whine of the motor. And what that whine noise is, is actually this brass gear meshing with the pinion gear. A lot of times these pinion gears, because they move at such a fast speed, they eventually become worn and they may create a noise. So listen to that whine as I move the speed control knob at a faster pace. You can hear the pitch increasing, as well as barely seeing the governor weights flaring outward. Here we see a slightly different angle of the gear train mechanism showing the two pulleys. The one that is below the bed plate attached to the casting and the one that is above the bed plate. Here we see the belt which drives the mechanism and this little pulley wheel here which is kind of like a tension wheel. If this wheel wasn't here the uh, mechanism would have trouble playing the records at a constant speed. A lot of old cylinder, me uh, cylinder phonographs have this little tension wheel which has a spring attached to it back here which allows the mechanism to uh, stay attached to the belt thus adding a little pressure so that it'll play at a constant steady speed. Some smaller inexpensive uh, phonographs like the uh, Columbia Model Q doesn't have that little pulley wheel it just has a straight belt but the belt is so tight and taut that it keeps the t constant speed of the motor unwinding and thus there's you know not a lot of wow and flutter or if any at all uh, on the record while it's playing. So here would be the mechanism on this side showing it running from top to bottom. Now the belts on these mechanisms are usually tapered on both ends when you're attaching them and the best way to attach them is with contact cement. Put a little dab on each side of the belt roughing up each end before you uh, put the glue on it and then once the glue is set what I do is I loop the belt around both pulleys and try to attach it either onto the top or the bottom pulley and then make it nice and tight and then hold it there for a few seconds until the glue is set that way you get a nice tight grip on the belt after it has been attached and here is the uh, the splice I know it's not coming out very well but there's the splice here we see the upper part of the gear train part of the mechanism down here we see the large drive gear for the feed screw we see this pair of gears here which are permanently attached to one another this gear here the smaller one is when it's in place with the drive gear for the mandrel shaft plays the two minute cylinders when this gear is moved over to this gear here it will play the four minute cylinders now what happens is the mandrel plays and turns at the same speed for two and four minute cylinders it's merely the feed screw that changes the speed when it's going to play the to, to keep up with the spacing of the grooves on the record and the grooves on the feed screw are spaced the same distance apart as the grooves on the record so when I release the, the brake and as you can see the drive gear down here which is turning the feed screw here is turning at a certain speed to play two minute records. When I move the gear change knob on top to the other position it meshes with the other gear, the smaller gear and thus will turn the feed screw gear at a slower speed to follow the grooves of the four minute records. But as you can see the belt and the upper shaft which is attached to the mandrel turn at a constant speed it is only the feed screw gear which changes now watch the belt and the upper shaft will move at, the, at a constant speed nothing changes there just the feed screw
Now, as I mentioned in my earlier part of the description of this phonograph, how it works, the mandrel shaft has this pulley or flywheel attached to it and it has a groove on the inside of it. Now attached to this groove is a little piece of spring which resembles what a mainspring looks like, a part of a mainspring, and it has an open end. Now this little flap here is the part that stops the mechanism when you're playing records with the auto stop. And down here is the little nipple that activates the auto stop so that when it is activated, and it's not very easily seen, but if I was to point it out, barely visible in there is that little piece of leather. When I activate the arm, you can see that it raises and lowers. So that when you look down here, if you can barely see that little piece of leather, and when I push down on the auto start lever, you can see that it releases if you're playing cylinders in the auto start mode. So that when I start, the mechanism you can see that the lever caught on the open part of that spring but when I release it by pushing down on the start leather lever you can see that the mechanism is turning and it's moving forward but if I push down on this little nipple on the side here to activate the auto stop you can see that that piece of leather caught on that little latch on this piece of spring and it stopped the mechanism at the end of the record. Now the way you would set the auto stop mechanism to play each cylinder is that you would take the reproducer and place it so that when you have a cylinder on the mandrel you would move the mandrel towards the end of the record so that you can see that the where the um, stylus of the reproducer would come to the very end of the last grooves of the playing surface of the record and then you would take and move this little foot loosen this knurled knob and move this little foot back and forth until you can feel it kind of hitting against that nipple and then once you have it set right you tighten down on this knob and then when you want to play your record, you bring the mandrel back to the starting position so that it would be at the starting grooves of the record. Press down on the auto start arm and then the mandrel will eventually turn and go towards the left towards that little auto stop foot. Now I'm going to bring this up and move it close so it's like right near it. And as you can see that little nipple is coming closer and closer to the foot and when it activates it it stops the mechanism from turning. But the thing about this uh, setup is is that the auto stop has to be reset for every cylinder because uh, not all cylinders were of the same playing length, of course. You know, some songs were shorter and longer than others. So you had to reset that auto stop for every different record that you would play. But it was very uh, effective and it was very reliable. Now here's where the reproducer would normally be on the uh, phonograph. But here below it are two important parts of the mechanism that one operates the uh, cueing device of the reproducer and the other is just merely a camel hair brush which brushes against the cylinder to clean off any dust as it's playing as you can see in the upper position and both of these operate with the uh, auto cueing uh, knob that starts the mechanism playing when it's in the stop position both the camel hair brush and this little flipper here, I call it a pancake flipper because that's what it looks like. When it's in the off position, they are up. Normally if the reproducer was on, which I will show you just by replacing it. With the reproducer in place, you can see that this piece of bent metal which is attached to the tail weight is up on top of this little flipper here so that when you start the mechanism 
in motion start using the starting lever this little flipper will move down and allow the tail weight to come in contact with the record thus playing the record so here's how it works and then once the mechanism is stopped either manually or with the auto stop the little flipper will push up against that piece of bent metal and raise the tail weight off of the record thus you can move the mandrel back and forth to uh, either cue the record up or to remove the record so here's how it works in the stopped position and now you're safely able to move the record across the mandrel without the stylus scraping across it here we see the Model M reproducer the components of the Model M reproducer are the body of the reproducer the underside we see the tail weight the stylus bar with the two and four minute stylus on it the stylus turnover bar the bearings on the front and the back to hold the stylus bar turnover device in place and a little spring which allows the turnover bar to stay in place otherwise it would kind of flap back and forth and we see the little cueing piece of metal the little cueing device and this is a little piece of metal which is welded into the tail weight to keep the tail weight from going any further down than it needs to and we see the other end of the stylus turnover bar here with a number two and four on it to denote the stylus that would be in place when you're playing a record now right here we see barely visible a little pin that goes through the stylus turnover bar to keep the stylus bar in place but as you can see that the pin doesn't hinder its movement and that you can move when the tail weight is moved up and down the stylus can move up and down with it and you get that little bit of leeway there because sometimes the records were a little might have a little out of roundness to them and a little irregularity so the stylus has to have a little movement a little free movement otherwise the purpose of this is just to um, allow the tail weight to move up and down on the record as it's being played barely visible inside here attaching the stylus bar to the diaphragm is a little piece of cord a little wax cord which is attached to a loop on the stylus bar and to a loop on the diaphragm now it's not very visible there so I have this model O reproducer which is uh, just a uh, a part of one and you can see the um, little loop in the middle of the diaphragm this is a brass diaphragm or copper diaphragm rather and you can see that little loop there which the wax cord attaches to which attaches to the stylus bar and here we see the retaining ring which is threaded and you can see these two little notches here which you can uh, insert a device to turn it to either tighten or loosen the retaining ring onto the reproducer housing and apart from the diaphragm there are two rubber gaskets in here one above and below the diaphragm to hold it in place so that you can adjust it so it won't touch the edges the metal edges of the reproducer housing or the retaining ring and plus there's another retaining ring underneath this which just adds as a spacer and you can see the uh, M which is stamped into the tail weight here which shows what model reproducer this is here we see a few other components of what a model O reproducer contains and what is also similar to the model M reproducer of the opera and here we see the little hole where that pin would go where it would fit through the body of the stylus bar and it would come out the other end just to uh, hold it in place and here we see another piece of a model O reproducer the upper part that would face the diaphragm and the lower part which would be facing the record and once again here's how the turnover mechanism works you have the spring which is underneath here which is kind of bowed out and when the stylus bar turnover bar is turned it flattens out that piece of spring and then when it comes back up 
the spring bows back up and holds the stylus bar in place and prevents it from flapping around. The stylus bar turnover device can only be turned in one direction. In other words, you can't keep turning this over and over and over in one direction. You either have to turn it one way for the two minute stylus or the other way for the four minute stylus. It doesn't turn in a complete circle. All right, now with the Amberola 1A mechanism back in its case, I'm going to end this video by playing a cylinder, a four minute cylinder, by Billy Jones and Chorus called Cristoforo Colombo on an Edison four minute blue Amberola cylinder number 5008. Hope you enjoy it. A sailor from my galley came running down the streets of Spain, the yelling hawks of Bali. Colombo went before the king to ask for ships and cargo. I'm sure a poor exploring man if I can't find Chicago. Oh, Christopher Colombo, he thought the world was wrong, though. That persevering, persevering sailor man, Colombo. <laughs> Back to sunny Spain, the people sang Hosanna. Colombo said, we're glad we're back, but we have no banana. Colombo came from Italy, he's so rice and confetti. He taught the queen of Spain the way to goggle her spaghetti. Oh, Christopher Colombo, he thought the world was round old. That rooted, tooted, highfalutin sailor man Colombo. <laughs> Colombo went to see the queen to ask for ships and money. He vamped her fair and on the square she used to call him honey. He vamped until she couldn't bear to have him hang around her. She pawned her jewels. Colombo cried, oh, ain't I glad I found her. Oh, Christopher Colombo, he thought the world was wrong, though. That persevering, persevering sailor man, Colombo. <laughs> One day the sailors came to Chris to go home was their notion. But Chris cried, land is near, I saw the bottles in the ocean. Colombo cried, when land they spied, my men, we sure are lucky. We'll soon be drinking juleps down in Louisville, Kentucky. Oh, Christopher Colombo, he thought the world was all known. That Rufin Tootin, Hyperlutin, Sailor Man Colombo. <laughs> The sailors soon got sore and quit, they made him eat an onion. They plucked his brow and pulled his nose and stepped upon his bunion. Yo ho, said Chris, I'd like to know what all the wild way saying. I'd like to know why people sing all oh, that we do were made. Oh, Chris, the bow, come on, the world was all known. That persevering, persevering, sailor and Columbo. The storm came rushing up, it was a powerful breeze. It blew and left poor Chris standing in his BBGs. One night it rained down cats and dogs, you should have seen it for. When Chris sarcastically sang out, it ain't gonna rain no more. Oh, Christopher Colombo, he thought the world was wrong, though. That rooted, tooted, hyperlutin sailor man the night it blew and blew till all were filled with pride. They asked Chris where the wine came from. He told them from the wine pipe. When wine was passed, one deck hand said, I'll take mine from the sideboard. This Chris is no such thing on deck. We'll serve you from the starboard. <laughs> He saw the Indians mean. Colombo saw a husky claw and cried, God save the queen. Oh, Christopher Colombo, he thought the world was wrong, though. That persevering, persevering sailor man, Colombo. Before Chris started out, 
to sail, he spliced himself in marriage. And when poor Chris returned to Spain, he had to push it to carriage. Mama! Mr. Bo Colombo, he thought the world was all gold. Said Rootin' Tootin' Highfalutin' Sailor Man Colombo. <laughs> Thanks for watching this little video of my presentation and uh, listening to the record at the end. If you'll notice near the end of the record he messed up one of his lines to the song and instead of saying he saw a husky squaw and cried God save the queen, he goes a husky quaw and scried God save the queen. Play it over again and listen and you'll find out what I mean. Alright, All right, YouTubers, this is Amberola1B signing off. Bye bye.